My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of strokes. In particular, I wanted to focus on a, a type of stroke known as cryptogenic stroke. Let me talk you through this. Okay. Now, the first thing to say is a stroke is often a devastating occurrence in a person's life. And this is so for several reasons. The first thing to say is a stroke in itself can be life-threatening. And in fact, stroke is widely recognized as a leading cause of death worldwide. The second thing is strokes can be disabling and therefore can destroy a person's quality of life if the person were to survive the stroke. The third thing is that a stroke may recur and therefore, even though you may escape the, the disabling consequences of a stroke the first time, there's always a worry in a person's mind as to whether they may be at a higher likelihood of having another stroke and that could then cause more damage or even death the next time. So it is really, really important when someone has a stroke to try and identify the cause of stroke and treat the underlying cause wherever possible. Now, what is stroke? Stroke is characterized by death of brain cells as a result of disruption of blood supply to the brain. Okay, so it's suffocation. The brain is composed of cells that needs blood. If you deprive the cells of the blood, the cells die and brain function uh, is, uh, is lost. Now, it's important to understand that there are two main types of stroke. The first is a hemorrhagic stroke. In a hemorrhagic stroke, what happens is that they, there's bleeding within the head, okay, within the brain, and that in itself deprives the brain cells of oxygen. Hemorrhagic strokes consist of about 17% of all strokes worldwide. And then there is ischemic stroke, which accounts for 83% of all strokes. In hemorrhagic strokes, there's a bleed. The blood blood would have gone to supply those cells but goes elsewhere and there's another problem with hemorrhagic strokes that is that the brain lies within an enclosed space you know the skull and therefore the accumulating blood which would ordinarily have gone to supply those blood cells leaks out and actually compresses the brain from outside and that can cause more damage to the brain so that's one of the problems with hemorrhagic strokes 17 percent of all strokes are hemorrhagic strokes ischemic strokes which are 83 percent of all strokes there's some sort of blockage so the blood is trying to get through to the cells via blood vessels and if somewhere there's a blockage in that blood vessel then the blood can't get through and the bit it was going to supply is then deprived of oxygen rich blood starts suffocating and dying in terms of blockages you can have blockages in the major vessels the big vessels and this is called large vessel atherosclerosis, or even in the smaller vessels, which is called small vessel uh, occlusion. It's also possible, there's another possibility, you may have no problem with the blood vessels, but you may form a clot elsewhere in the body, and that clot can get dislodged and go up these vessels and then get stuck somewhere, and thereby preventing the blood from getting through. Uh, and this is called cardioembolism. Conditions such as atrial fibrillation, a heart rhythm disturbance, one of the commonest heart rhythm disturbances, are associated with stroke as a consequence of cardioembolism. In atrial fibrillation, um, blood stagnates, the stagnation of blood forms clots, those clots get dislodged and thereby cause strokes, cardioembolic strokes. So those are usually the causes of strokes. What is interesting, however, is when you, you have a patient who has a stroke, you want to look for these things. But in 15 to 40 percent of patients, no obvious cause is found for the stroke on basic investigations. These patients are therefore described as having had a cryptogenic stroke. A cryptogenic stroke is a stroke where they cannot find an obvious cause for the stroke. Uh, and a cryptogenic stroke is particularly distressing for lots of reasons. Uh, the first thing to say is cryptogenic strokes tend to be more common in younger patients, in patients under the age of 45 years of age. Secondly, unless a cause is found, it is difficult for that patient to be reassured that the treatment that they're being given is truly reducing the recurrence of a second event. And thirdly, a stroke uh, may be the symptom of something even more sinister, such as a malignancy within the body or an autoimmune condition such as vasculitis. And in those people who have 
basic normal investigations who are identified as having a cryptogenic stroke where basic investigations haven't shown anything, it becomes really important that these patients are subjected to a more rigorous set of assessments uh, which extend beyond basic investigations. And in this video, I'm going to discuss some of the important questions to ask and investigations to consider in patients who've had a cryptogenic stroke. That may actually help delineate a cause for the cryptogenic stroke. So I think the first thing always with any such patient is it's important to uh, uh, take a really good history of what happened. Particularly, I think it's really important to work out whether the neck has been manipulated in some way. Um, you know, if the neck has been manipulated, then something could have been pressed, compressed, uh, and that could be a manifestation. So when you go looking, you don't find anything, but that could be a possibility. Uh, also, recent dental work or any invasive procedures may be relevant. Why? Because you could release, um, uh, you know, when, when you're doing dental work, you may introduce infection. Infection could form a little embolism. The embolism could travel and cause, cause a stroke. Uh, intravenous drug abuse is also really important. You know, so people are injecting things in their veins, etc., and that can cause um, particles to go and get deposited. Recent pregnancy is, again, an important thing to mention. So it's always worth bearing those things in mind when you're thinking about what may have happened. In terms of symptoms, it's also important also to find out whether the patient has described anything else before the stroke happened. Were they tired? Were they losing weight? Were they getting pains in their legs? Were they getting night sweats, weight loss, night sweats? These point towards things like a cancer of some sort, which may not, which may be in the body. Uh, and the first manifestation of that may have been the scriptogenic stroke. So really important to think about those things. And also things like uh, fatigue, claudication, which may suggest this thing called a vasculitis, an inflammation of our blood vessels that can also contribute to causing things like strokes. If our blood vessels are diseased, more likely to have problems with the reduction in the blood supply through those blood vessels. Again, very important to ask about things like high blood pressure, diabetes, elevated cholesterol levels, a family history of premature heart disease, stroke, and even sudden death. And during examination, I think it's really important for the doctor to make sure that the pulses in all the blood vessels are equal and strong. So you should feel the pulse not only in one hand, but both hands. And ideally, listen to the neck to make sure there are no extra noises which could indicate turbulence of blood through that uh, vessel. And those are important things to do. And then you want to do a bunch of scans and investigations to try and look further. In those patients, um, I think it is very, very important to do comprehensive uh, imaging of the brain, but also of the blood vessels around the head and neck. Um, and whenever a person goes in with what sounds like a stroke, it is really important to do an urgent CT scan, a CAT scan of the head. And this is important for several reasons, okay? It helps delineate between a hemorrhagic stroke and an ischemic stroke. You want to be confident that the person hasn't had a big bleed in their head as opposed to a blood vessel blocking off. Why is that important? Because if it's a bleed in the head, then you may need to relieve the compression, the pressure on the brain from this extra bleeding. Whereas if it's uh, an ischemic stroke, then the treatment is to try and open up the obstruction or thin the blood so that the blood can get through the obstruction easier uh, or break any clot. Whereas if you had a hemorrhagic stroke at that time, then you could make that worse. That's why we do scanning of the brain almost immediately when a person presents with what sounds like a stroke. Uh, also, another thing to be aware of is in ischemic stroke, we can often give a clot-busting agent, okay, which would break up a clot. But if you had a bleed, then that would obviously be very dangerous. And again, that's why it's really, really important to know what kind of stroke you're dealing with. What if the brain scan is normal? Remember, when the CAT scan is negative and doesn't show an obvious stroke, it becomes important not to stop there, but to do something called an MRI scan. The reason is that in Sometimes when you have had a stroke at the back of the brain, in the posterior lobe of the brain, you may not see it as easily on a CAT scan, and an MRI scan would show it a lot better. And therefore, if you had a CAT scan, it's normal, but you have the symptoms of stroke, an MRI is really, really important. And then the next step is to look at the blood vessels leading to the brain, and in particular, the blood vessels in the neck, 
um, especially the carotid arteries. How do you look at these blood vessels? Well, there are different modalities. You could use ultrasound, so this is easily available. It's just sound waves. It's like um, when pregnant women have their babies looked at, but you can look at the neck vessels that way. It's very easily available. Most hospitals have it, very portable, very low risk investigation. But the views are often a little fuzzy and the quality is dependent on the person doing the scan and also how good the windows are and you know, people who are very big, you may not necessarily see it as clearly. Then there's a test called CT angiography. In CT angiography, um, it, it does involve radiation, okay? Uh, and also contrast is given to the patient, but this may be a much better way of delineating the neck, head and neck vessels. It can potentially affect the kidneys, the contrast, etc. So sometimes people are reluctant to give it in patients with pre-existing kidney problems. Uh, and then there's MR angiography, magnetic resonance angiography, which doesn't require radiation, but is quite time consuming and requires specialized equipment. The reason uh, it is so important to look at the head and neck vessels is that if there is evidence of a blockage of the big vessels, then it may actually be possible to mechanically go and fish out the blood clot that is blocking this big vessel and restore the blood supply and thereby any um, brain cells that are suffocating but still alive will get the blood and come back to life, so to speak. Previously, this was thought to be only beneficial if you got in there within a six hour window, but now uh, some research suggests that there may be benefit even up to 16 hours. So again, well worth um, doing. Once you've studied the brain and you've studied the blood vessels in the head and neck, the next question is where else could the problem be? And certainly the next step would be to study the heart in more detail because the heart is pumping blood all over. And if there was a clot or something going on in the heart, then that could be another mechanism behind this. So anyone who has a cryptogenic stroke, I would thoroughly advise that investigation doesn't just stop at the brain and the head and neck, but also look at the heart. And in that sense, I think all patients should have a 12 lead ECG and then have at least a heart monitor. And the reason to look for the heart monitor is to look for atrial fibrillation, because in atrial fibrillation, as I've mentioned, there's stagnation of blood within the heart, blood clots that can form. And when you find atrial fibrillation, your treatment for that stroke changes, because at this point in time, if you have a, a stroke, doctors would use antiplatelet agents but if you find that they have atrial fibrillation which could be associated with the stroke then you go on stronger blood thinning medications anticoagulants they're not blood thinners but they stop the blood from clotting or from clot formation and they're called anticoagulants like warfarin eliquis that kind of thing it is really really important to tell you this that just because an ECG and a 24-hour monitor does not show atrial fibrillation does not mean that the patient couldn't be having atrial fibrillation. You cannot reliably exclude atrial fibrillation as a possible cause for the stroke. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense to monitor the heart for a prolonged period of time because atrial fibrillation can come and go. So just because you don't see atrial fibrillation on that six second 12 lead ECG or a 24 hour period doesn't mean that the atrial fibrillation isn't coming and going and therefore most people would recommend much longer monitoring. Unfortunately this is not routinely done in most centers but as a patient I want to empower you to say to your doctors if you're worried about a cryptogenic stroke that they really need to monitor you for much longer. Now there's some really interesting studies which have suggested how beneficial prolonged monitoring can be to pick up atrial fibrillation and thereby change your management. Because if you have atrial fibrillation, standard management for the stroke is not going to be enough. You need to go on an anticoagulant. And what the uh, researchers have found is that if you do a 24 hour ECG in patients with cryptogenic strokes, you'll find atrial fibrillation in 3.2% of those patients. But if you then extend that monitoring, instead of 24 hours, you do 30 days, you will pick up atrial fibrillation in 16% of patients. If you can extend it even further, where you're actually putting an implantable monitor in the heart and monitoring the heart for up to two years, the pickup of AF was 7.3 fold greater. The reason many centers don't do it is because of economics. You know, they don't, they can't afford it. 
Um, but I think anyone who has a cryptogenic stroke should at least have a 30-day monitor and ideally even a reveal device, this monitor, which can stay in you for two years. Uh, because if you find AF, well, that gives you a mechanism for the cryptogenic stroke and therefore you would change treatment. It's also important uh, for patients to have some form of imaging of the heart. This is to look for mainly four things. One, to visualize a clot within the heart, which may sit in a small beak-shaped structure within the atrium called the left atrial appendage. There may even be clot in the ventricle that you can see. To look for any masses or tumors within the heart, which may break off and go to the brain. To look for vegetations may result, which may result from an infection, so little bits of infection sitting on a valve could break off and cause blood uh, could cause strokes and also to look for shunts within the heart a hole in the heart which allows blood to cross over so if there's a shunt within the heart what can happen is you could form a blood clot in your leg and the blood clot could dislodge ordinarily the blood clot would go to the right side of the heart and go towards the lungs where it may even be destroyed but actually because there's a hole, an abnormal connection within the heart, the blood clot actually goes through the hole to the left side of the heart, which is pumping blood to the brain and go up to the brain. Uh, it is true to say that about 20, 20 to 25% of the population have a tiny hole within their heart called a PFO. And that doesn't just mean, just because you have that connection doesn't mean that that is why you've had the stroke. But in some people, if you have a big hole, then there is some data that if you close the hole, you reduce the risk of future strokes because this could be a mechanism by which the stroke happened. It can't just be because of the hole. It must be something else as well. A blood clot would have to form somewhere. Uh, but that's really important to just bear in mind. Um, in terms of uh, imaging, we usually start off with just a simple echocardiogram uh, and the echocardiogram will not pick up a tiny hole in the heart. And in those people, what you have to do is do a bubble study where you inject micro bubbles into the right heart, into a vein. They go into the right heart and they should there then go to the lungs and get destroyed. But if you have a small hole, then these micro bubbles would be seen to cross over into the left heart where they shouldn't be. And that tells you that there's a hole in the heart. Okay, And that's a bubble contrast echo to look for shunts in the, in the heart in patients who have a cryptogenic stroke and you've not found any other cause. Um, there's another way of looking at the heart in a bit more detail and that's a transesophageal echocardiogram where you can get the patient to swallow a probe and look at the heart from the back and that's very good to look at this beak shaped structure called the left atrial appendage which is where patients with um, atrial fibrillation form their clot. Uh, now uh, if there is nothing found on the heart scans then what? I guess it next is to try and study the blood itself because you've studied the brain, you've studied the blood vessels going up to the brain, you've studied the heart, which is a conductor of this orchestra, and then you want to study the blood itself. And there may be patients who have um, hypercoagulable states where the blood is in some way more prone to forming blood clots. These include something called antiphospholipid syndrome. People who have cancer have more hypercoagulable coagulability uh, and some people have this thing called thrombophilia which means that their blood is just more prone to forming blood clots. This is found in about one to four percent of cryptogenic strokes uh, so worth knowing um, and sometimes uh, despite all these tests we never work out why the stroke happened. Nevertheless as I say it is really really important to go beyond standard investigations to look for the cause of stroke. So it's very important to be as rigorous as possible. As a cardiologist, if I had a patient with a cryptogenic stroke, I would always recommend two things. Prolonged heart monitoring, so that you're not missing atrial fibrillation, which will definitively change your management and get you to put the patient on an anticoagulant. And the second thing I would always recommend is a bubble study to look for a big hole in the heart, which could then potentially be mechanically closed, reducing the risk of strokes for the patient. So I hope you found this useful. I'll put the transcript of this video up on my website. I would love to hear from you to see 
uh, what you thought of this video and once again thank you for all that you do for me. Uh, I just wanted to also add you may know that I was recently involved in a fundraising appeal for my colleague who had COVID-19 who was very unwell. I am so so grateful for all the support you gave me then. Thankfully he's better, thankfully we have some security uh, for him and his family and he um, also sent me a message to uh, ask me to uh, pass his great gratitude across to you. So once again, thank you so much. All the best. Take care. Bye.